Am I still on? on TikTok. He's on Twitter, Facebook, and Insta, and he's got a show on YouTube called Canada's Chad. we got an hour with him. Welcome aboard. This band is hot for 8 o'clock in the morning. Dude, I appreciate your time. I know you're working midnight, so you're kind of just coming off shift. So I appreciate that. At least I don't have to deal with a, you know, a morning guy that's all groggy and stuff like that. How are you feeling these days, bro? I'm good, bro. Things are getting crazy here, but, you know, we're making do. We're staying positive and we're getting shit done. So how did you get dragged into this? You ever been political before? I, I found you on TikTok and then was surprised when... I tried to, well, I said, are we still good? Because we set up a, an interview the other day, and you're like, dude, uh, yeah, we got a thing going on in Welland, and I'm going to try and be there. I'm like, dude, you're a Welland boy? So I didn't know you were local. When I found you on TikTok, I don't know why. I thought you were in Vancouver or something. How did you get involved in this stuff? Yeah, so I'll give you my, my background. My name is Chad Latanzio. I, I've always had a political opinion. Ever since high school, I was a little bit involved. But, you know, most like most teenage kids that had, like, liberal ideals, I, I definitely wouldn't consider myself ever being a liberal, but I'm leaning more that way. Uh, and then as I got like older, into the, like, as pretty much as I got into the workforce, I started to see how much the government was taking from me and like the, how much liberal policies are bad. And I kind of switched over to conservatism and I started my channel. So that, like, I mean, I'm 27 years old. I started my channel last year as uh, dur during the pandemic. I started I, because I just had enough people say, you know, you have a really good opinion. Why don't you start putting putting this on the Internet? And I was like, you know what, let, let's give it a go. So I started doing like a new show, which yeah, it's titled Canada's Chat. It used to be titled um, Millennial Tory early on. I, I've had a few different names, but now I've kind of settled on this one that's permanent and I, I started doing a new show and then i started doing what, what you do i started asking people to come on for interviews and that's called the daily maple podcast that i do on my show as well and that would that that's when i really started to pick up steam that's when the maxine bernier reached out i reached out to maxine bernier and he came onto my channel after i had like only been a, a channel for about a month and that's when everybody started, uh, kind of took off a little bit from there and then I started doing on the street videos at the uh, the first St. Catharines anti lockdown rally that like Alicia like, that was at Chrome Barbershop, Alicia Herder's place there. Now we did a little bit of on the street videos going around asking people different types of questions like what they thought of politics and uh, the main question was uh, what do you think of Doug Ford and there wasn't too many kind responses to that. And that's what I've been doing. Uh, the TikTok's been going up as well. I do a lot of rants on my page. That seems to be the uh, most popular part of my platform. So I've been on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, doing that kind of stuff. And I really enjoyed the last year and a half of doing it, almost two years now. And I, it's good to get politically involved. I think everybody should. Like I said, I was someone who always had an opinion. I never started voice, voicing it until recently. I think I, and not, not, not that I regret not doing it earlier, but I think that more young people got involved, we could actually save this nation a lot sooner than we are doing it right now. Have you ever been political before? If so, what type of activism or what kind of involvement have you had or is this kind of your first step into politics because i consider you kind of an activist right you're a relentless troll on social media which i think is important um it's kind of a necessary evil uh because well you got to fight fire with fire so have you ever been politically motivated before or, or active at all in anything not really, no. So I, I wanted to get involved in politics in uh, about 2019, 2020, and I, I uh, reached out to a, a close a friend of mine, Sam Oosterhoff, who's the uh, MPP for Niagara West under Doug Ford, and he was the first politician to take my phone call, and I wanted to get involved with the party, like do volunteer work, you know, phone calls, whatever it had. 
So I reached out to him um, and said, like, how can I get involved with the federal campaign for the CPC? And he told me, like, the steps to do it. And I reached out to them, and it was very negative, like, the response we got. They wanted me to sit around and do phone calls, and it really put a bad taste in my mouth for the party. And then I was looking for other options, because after the Conservative Party kind of went very left, I found myself, like most Canadians, politically homeless. And that's when I discovered the PPC, and I wanted to get involved right away. I love what the platform stood for. I never... Um, like, I wouldn't consider myself really an activist. I like to consider myself a political commentator. I'm obviously against lockdowns, and I do advocate for that. But I would like to, like, see my career being more along the lines of, like, Tucker Carlson as opposed to, like, you know, Chris Guy or something like that. So the PPC, when I reached out to the PPC, uh, the writing director in the area at the time, Jim Torma, he brought me on, like, invited me over to his house. We had, we had a barbecue. We talked, we talked about politics. We talked about a, a plan of attack. And the PPC really wanted people on the ground to get involved and actually be, like, super involved with the party. Like, I've actually gotten to drive Max to a protest like that was super cool and i'm just somebody who volunteers like i don't have an official role i'm not a candidate i'm not like a director i'm just somebody who volunteers my time with my local riding within niagara falls with peter terrace and i try and help out with max when he comes here and that was the what really got me like um really captivated by the ppc and getting involved in politics because when i did get involved with the cpc or at least try to i got a really bad taste in my mouth for it it didn't seem fun it seemed boring it seemed like the the reason why people don't want to get into politics is they find it boring. I think that would be the the kind of attitude I got from the CPC. But once the PPC started to gain steam and come around, it really changed the landscape. Like the ratings have gone up ever since the PPC has been like on the on the national platform now, and the social media has been booming with it. People have been getting more involved in politics and finding it fun and exciting. Like. Like, like you said, I do a little trolling online. Like the PPC, yeah, like we make memes, we have cool videos. It's not just like boring policy, pol- like reading policy off after one after another. It's really gotten like the next generation more involved in politics. And I, I find myself reaching out to more Zoomer generations, like the kids in their early 20s just coming out of high school who are wanting to join the PPC. So uh, seeing that is a really good um, an indicator for me that this party is the party for the next generation. I just hope that more young people can get involved with this party because ever since I've gotten involved with politics, at, like at the, my late 20s to 27, I wish I would have done it sooner because it has been a lot of fun. The PPC has been a, a great party to help out and volunteer with. And I, I just, uh, I'm really glad that I did it. And yeah, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a fast, it's been an exciting two years so far since being involved with the party. It's like the, obviously the political landscape is changing drastically right now with everything that's gone on in the last two years. And I'm glad to be a part of it. I actually feel bad for anybody who's not because this is possibly the greatest political movement in Canada, in Canadian history. And people are waking up to it. You know, we're, we're, we're at 11% in the polls. We're about to overtake the NDP. And I think people are waking up to that. Dude, uh, I love your voice. It is like literally your voice in the community standing for what you believe. But do you feel like you're going to become a target? Do you th- feel like you're going to be a victim of cancel culture? I know you use loose language. I'm guilty of that as well. And, you know, I, I'm kind of sensitive to the argument. You know, the message gets lost in the in the harsh language. Yes and no. I mean, in my case, it's the only reason it made the news. So it brought my harsh language brought actually light to, a, you know, a, a subject that was important to me. Are you fearful that they're the mainstream media? I'm telling you, it's coming. Are you fearful <laughs> that it's going to get you canceled, though, or it's going to have repercussions on your income and your family? No, no, absolutely. Absolutely not. I, I know the laws that around that with cancer culture, people are trying to come after people for their jobs and stuff like that. And like, it's a very, it's a very slippery slope. You have to know your rights when it comes to that. But I'm not even worried about that. Like in terms of cancel culture, like, uh, let's talk about my political career. Like if, it's, if, if, if that's going to end, right, because someone's going to try and cancel me, that's never going to happen. Cancel culture is this thing that the radical left does to try and get people off the air, try and get people like ruin people's lives essentially. And it only works if you cancel yourself. Like they can't cancel you if you don't cancel yourself. If they, if you, if they want to come at you as something, because like, you, you're right. I do use vulgar language. I'm pretty offensive in my, in my commentary. And I always say that the time and a place, like there's a difference between what I rant off in a 60 second TikTok as opposed to like my longer YouTube videos where I go into deep dives and conversations and then the interviews as well. There's definitely a time and a place for different types of rhetoric in my opinion, but I have no fear that somebody can cancel me because i refuse to bow down to the mob i don't apologize for anything that i say and i think that makes it worse like and like look at this example okay an example i can give you in the nfl when drew Brees said that uh, he will never respect somebody who doesn't stand for the flag he got ripped apart for it, and then he apologized and things just got worse for him on the other hand brian erlacher stood against the, like the, the black lives matter movement all this like this anti-patriotism in america and he doubled down when they tried to come for him and then his like beef jerky sales went through the roof for his company like it actually made him better so if you just double down on your opinions and you and 
and the only way you can actually do that is if you actually believe in what you're saying. And that's another reason why I don't fear cancel culture because I don't slip up. Like I don't tweet something or I don't make a rant and say something I'm going to regret later. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. That's how you. That, that's being sloppy. That's not being a good commentator. So anything I put out there, I believe in and I'm honest about. So I will never take something bad that I'm honest about and like apologizing makes it a hundred percent worse. What do you find are the most uh, passionate issues that you seem to be speaking out against? Like your top three, starting with the most important one. If you could change anything, if you, you know, I asked uh, Dan McTeague this the other day. He's an energy uh, guy and a former liberal. Well, I guess he's still kind of liberal, but he's disavowed the party under Trudeau. You know, um, what was I? Where was I going now? My brain just farted. <laughs> that was one of the most important issues to me. I yeah, think, yeah, so and I asked uh, him, like, if if you were the president of Canada, I know that's you know fantastical, and you had a bunch of executive orders, what issues would you take on immediately, and what would you do? So, what do you, I, I'm not asking you that question. You can answer it if you want, but what what do you find the most the issues that you're talking about the most in this campaign? Right now, uh, definitely most recently would be the vaccine passports. That seems to be the, the number one topic of this entire election coming up as well. So I've definitely been speaking out uh, on that as much as possible. And that seems to be where most of my rhetoric has been. But one thing about like the PPC and lockdowns as well is that like there's so much more going on in this federal election than just COVID-19 and, and the lockdowns and the vaccine uh, passports. Like That seems to be the main topic of discussion. That is something I'm very passionate about and want to fight for. But like... The, the problem I see most in this country is the culture change that we have seen over the last like 30 or 40 years. Like it, it, Canada is not the same country it was 30, 40 years ago. My, my parents tell me that I mean, I'm only 27 years old, but even from when I was a kid, the country has changed drastically. And I think that's a massive culture change in our society. That uh, is something that people need to solve themselves. Like a politics, you can set policies, you can make, you can know, you can save people money in taxes, you can, you know, control immigration. You can do a lot of good things with policies, but when it comes to the culture of the nation, that's done amongst the people. One thing that cult that that policy can do to change the culture and something else that I advocate for that I know the PPC is big on as well is to limit the amount of immigration. We we don't support mass immigration. We have way too many immigrants coming in every year. We need to like cut that number down. We need to, like, especially now with the, with the labor market that we currently have in Canada, people aren't getting back to work. It's not really the time for that. And people will, will call Max racist for saying that or like, like he's discriminatory because he doesn't want immigrants or refugees coming here. No, like that's not the case. And nobody's saying nobody can come here. We're just saying we need to put Canada and Canadians first. And that's, uh, that's definitely a, a policy issue that can help with the culture issues in the country but i think the biggest issue that i um, that i advocate for is like valuing traditionalism over the uh, common mo modern entity like we see um with the leftist movements like you know the uh the, the sex positivity movement for example where they, they tell a girl this it's good to go sleep with a bunch of guys it's good to go be like the sorry for my language be a slut like there's actually an annual slut march in california and they, they, they take it as a good thing and on the flip side like men need to also wake up and realize like it's not cool to go sleep with a bunch of women like you should want to value tradition being faithful to one woman starting a family having a bunch of kids getting get in a house having a good job and living a traditional lifestyle and i think on a, like a personal level there's people i talk to every day because i do have a lot of young men who follow me like they did something i try and instill in them is you guys need to start valuing tradition like um stop with what's going on like you know like, we have an over sexualized culture of our entire nation like that's it around the entire world you know we have problems like we have a huge pornography problem amongst young men you know we have websites like only fans that are, are taking advantage of young girls who like you know and that they don't really see the consequences of that until it's too late so i really think that um on a personal level people i talk to every day that would be actually um be number one aside from the covid lockdowns is we need we have a serious culture problem where we actually promote degeneracy and we reject traditionalism which i think is a, is a massive problem like where for example in texas like they just they just uh passed the anti the uh the abortion bill that was going to ban abortions i forget the exact numbers but people are freaking out about it and that's actually horrendous like i'm, I'm someone who's pro-life and that's obviously a traditional value and i think that things like these, these leftist ideologies are not only like satanic in some ways but they have really crumbled our society when when we have like kids coming from broken homes like divorces are at like, all-time high you know when you're when you're kind of being raised by the internet or you're being raised without a father at home or as a boy raised without a mother you don't really know how to treat the opposite person when you, it comes time to like dating or things like that and it's created a lot of problems and i think if young men could actually take the stand and be like real men like they like we were decades ago i think that can solve a lot of issues and that comes from things like you know getting a good job you know supporting your family if that's what you want to do or in, in my case i don't have a family yet but I, I work hard so my future family doesn't need to you know, um you know struggle um going to the gym you know getting getting physically in shape you know you be being a powerful figure you know you want to be able to protect people you want to be able to protect yourself and not saying like you should work out so you can beat people up but you want to actually like feel good be healthy another another one especially with the COVID thing going on right now that that's not talked about enough and 
just those things I think are, can solve a lot of the culture problems. Like if we brought the nuclear family back into our society and made that the the mainstream culture, not the counterculture that it currently is, I think we can solve a lot of issues that we wouldn't need even politics to be a part of. Have they come for you based on your beliefs? Because standing for traditional marriage, you know, will get you slagged as a homophobe. Even if you have the evidence to say, you know what, this is the most successful family unit ever devised. Like we've we've seen two women and two men how they bring up kids it's not as good as having a man and a wife in the in the home you stand for tightening immigration numbers because your employment situation well you're a xenophobe you're xenophobic you're a bigot you're racist so i mean we know the left kind of spins it like this but you know how how does it feel to be standing in a space that you got to think the majority of Canadians are standing in, but are silent on, and then you being pillared or, you know, being uh, demonized for standing for good, healthy values. Like, you want to keep children alive. How is that a bad thing? Tell me, you know, the dichotomy of being in a space of traditionality and then being skewered for it. Yeah, so I would say actually the most people have come after me are, are for my stance on being pro-life. I would say that's definitely been one that people have attacked me the most for. But again, with this, the doubling down, like I don't care what somebody who believes in baby murder being okay thinks of me. Like I, I really don't really value your opinion. If you think it's okay to murder babies, then that then you, you have a lot of messed up problems in your head. And I think that like that, that person that is dealing with a lot of emotional issues, maybe some mental health issues that I don't really need to involve myself with. So their opinion to me doesn't really get me down. It's, it's almost like, like, for example, I have a buddy who works in the jail and he has inmates call him names all the time. Like they call him a pay, they make fun of him. Like, and he gets, he gets pissed off. I'm like, buddy, why do you care what a degenerate criminal inmate says about you? You are literally a, a correctional officer making good money. You have a good family. Why do you care what that person's opinion? Is it really, that, what, what, what is that person's value to you? And that's how I kind of look at that in that sense. And when it comes to like your balanced traditional family, like I've been called a homophobe for sure. And I actually, uh, during Pride Month, I um, that people tried to cancel me because I called out a CFL player for wearing a dress to his vaccine appointment. His name was John Rush. He used to play for Winnipeg. He doesn't play anymore, but um, he it was all on the news. And I called him out. He tried to get me canceled on Instagram. Like he tried to like literally get my account taken down, and, and all his like little cronies came out like the content and started posting stuff. And I didn't care because I thought this is something that's like tearing down masculine society like you are supposed to be an alpha male you're a you're a cfl football player you're 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 a pretty big dude you're looking guy why are you trying to promote this degeneracy of like this trans this transgenderism and like we really let them the reason i'm so opposed to it and i think more people are getting opposed to it now is because the real agenda is coming out that it's all about like not all about but a lot of it's about pedophilia and trying to normalize pedoph- like pedophilia as a sexuality and that's now like become the narrative it's almost like a p in the lgbtq now like they call they call themselves maps and no maps on twitter it's very disgusting rhetoric and i know there's a lot of people who are right-wing uh, you know conservatives i see a lot in the states who are who are openly gay and they oppose this kind of stuff there's even a, a transgender uh, uh, republican her name's blair white who I, don't, I don't follow i know who she is i don't really follow her content anymore i used to and she's definitely against like you know converting children and how the agenda is really pushing that and she's totally against it and i know maxime uh, a couple of days ago was at a rally saying that he is not opposed to like if you want to get transgender surgery that as an adult fine but we should not be pushing this on kids and we should not be pushing the rhetoric like it, it, these the the gay and transgender community accounts for less than like about 1.6 percent of the population that's an american number so it's not that's not canadian and um why is that now the mainstream culture like that that, that, that really shouldn't be the case and I think it, what the problem is, is the sexualization of it. Because when it, when it comes down to it, you're really talking about who you like to have sex with. And that's making your entire identity about that. I think that's wrong. And they don't understand that when they're trying to teach, like, I get I get the the blanket statement that we just want kids to be accepting of other people. And that's what we're teaching them and stuff. And I, I get that. But if that was actually the case, why the hell are you having drag queen story time hour when people, we have, you have these men dressed up as women twerking in front of like five-year-olds? Like, why is that happening? That's not trying to promote inclusiveness. That's trying to promote sexualization of children. And now that that is being like, now that's in the mainstream, like drag, drag, drag queen story hour is an actual thing. And people are starting to see that and they're waking up to it. But the problem is this started with accepting gay marriage and that's where it's escalated from. So I, do we need to go back and oppose gay marriage to get rid of all this? I don't know. I don't think we need to go there. 
because like there's a lot of gay couples who I even know who are, are against all this stuff. They're just like normal people. Like um, this might sound offensive, but like you wouldn't know they're gay. Like they're, like, they're there's a you know they just they dress normal. Like they don't dress like what I like to call the skittle people. You know, like they, the people who wear the rainbow flags and make it all about that. Like I really don't understand why who you sleep with needs to be your entire identity or that big of a deal. Like I don't give a shit. So why are you trying to make that like it, it, if that is your entire identity, you are dealing with a lot of identity issues and you need to find something else to satisfy. Like to, give you satisfaction in life because that that ain't, that isn't it and like you said like the lifestyle like children are raised the same way of uh, uh, like two dads or two moms as supposed to uh, dad and mom and that's 100 percent true and what people you know i think people realize if they don't maybe don't call it out is there's always a male and female you know um uh gender role in these relationships there's always a like you know there's a masculine woman and a feminine woman like that that's a thing okay like it's not it's not a secret you see it you can see it with couples not all but for generally speaking there's more of a masculine figure and more of a feminine figure but the problem with that is the mentality is never going to be there because a woman's never going to be a man like a woman's never going to be able to teach her son what a father can and the mother's and, and vice versa right it's not to say that men, women aren't better than men or men are better than women we're just different and i think that they complement one another and without that it's like the, like the yin and yang right without that you know adam and eve you know that's that's, that's you know i'm Christian as well, so that, that is a belief of mine. So, it, why is it bad to say that that's that that's good and healthy for kids? Am I saying that gay couples shouldn't be able to adopt kids? No, but I do think there needs to be a lot of mental screening for that. And it's not really fair to say like you know you, I've seen some videos of parents bringing kids to Pride Festival and like it's like wait, now okay it looks like it looks like every gay gay kid now or transgender kid has gay parents or something like that. So wait, is it? And when you look at those numbers and you realize all these kids who are dealing with gender identity issues and they're coming out as gay, like 10, 10, 12, 13 years old, if their parents are either transgender or, or gay or in that community, they're always end up being like about that community, like that they make it their entire identity, they may, may be activists in it. And I get that's the only, only things you see on the news, so it might not be every case, but when, the, when we see the vast majority of that being implemented, you know it's not nature, it's nurturing. That they're getting it from what they may be taught in school, might be taught at home, and like, I don't think that's right. You shouldn't be pushing any kind of ideology on, on children when it comes to sexualization. But I think the, the, the norm, well, it used to be, is if you didn't teach kids about sex, they would grow up to be straight. And I, I think that's, you know, that's fine. That's good if you, if, you know, if, if them seeing normal as man with woman as they get older and that, that you know, go through puberty and understand those things, if that's the norm, that's fine. But now that's like a bad thing. And, and that's where and that's why we have kids being very confused. And I think it's a bad thing. We you know we see transition. You know, we see, and, and I think when it comes to transgenderism, that's a bigger issue than obviously like the, the gay community because you know fifty one percent of these people commit suicide, and that and that number doesn't change after surgery. And like I don't like I'm against it. I'm against it all. But that's because I want to see people stop killing themselves. If we can find a way to solve that problem, then maybe that'd be great. And I really just don't think that allowing a man to cut his dick off is solving that problem. I man, I agree with so much of what you just said. Oh. I, I can't think of anything I disagree with. Um, I really, when they come for the kids, for me, that's the filthiest thing. And I don't have children, but I, lo I like them. I'm, I'm obsessed with them. Uh, uh, my buddy had his, uh, did an interview yesterday, and I got to see his, he's about 18 months old, and he's, he, you should see how tall he is. He, it's just the most beautiful thing. And, you know, they get a chance to go around the corner and have a smoke while I while I play with the kid, and they're like, "Oh, Uncle Jimbo, hey, I, I love these kids, man! It's unbelievable." So, the drag queen story time, the sexualization of children. I just kids don't care about sex. Can we not talk about it until they start asking? Or like, I mean, it by not ha we all had the conversation. I don't know how old I was, but it was totally inappropriate at, at the age that I was I didn't need to know all that yet you know what I mean and uh you know I mean my father was cool with it and it was fine it was awkward I remember sitting on the couch and sitting and like it was a big fucking deal right it's like uh if you lie to your children all the time and tell them Santa Claus is real and then they find out you've been lying to them for 10 years that they're not going to be cool with that anyway I'm oh, blathering now but uh and leading with your sexuality you know and and gay people don't do that they don't introduce themselves like hi i'm jim i'm gay hi i'm jim i like to you know it's like how many people introduce themselves hi i'm heterosexual I like anal <laughs> you know I mean, it's the stupidest thing and then um you talk about the minority of people as well mental health is something serious with transgenderism i believe because you see the suicidal rate uh before and after you know, this idea that, uh, you know, 
we should start to transition children before their natural puberty freaks me out. But again, leading with the ideology, here, here's the bottom line. And I think I heard you say this. We don't care. I don't <laughs> care, care who you love or how you love. I care if you like animals. Okay. That concerns me. If you like children, you're causing harm, right? you're that causing concerns harm. me. But most people don't lead with that if that's their kink. Right. And I think that's, you know, a lot of it's a sick kink somehow, but we don't care. The heterosexuals of the world aren't going around and making fun. We don't even care enough to mock you. Do whatever you want. We just want to be left alone. We don't want your ideology shoved down our throats <laughs> for bad, ba you know, bad analogy in this case. But you know, it's <laughs> well, like, are, right? like we don't care. So. If we don't care, that means we don't hate you. We just don't care. Like it, it, we don't care. So stop telling us that we're a certain way because we really just don't, we think you maybe should keep it to yourself and stop leading with it. It's, but if you take that identity from them, these losers have nothing. And that's why you know you can't talk about the gay community this way because they're not that way. And I do like your idea of the leading wedge, you know. Gavin McInnes talks about this. Yeah, I was fine with same-sex marriage. Like, what the hell? I actually fought for it. But then I feel like I've been duped. I feel yeah. like I got tricked because now it's being used by a different, you know, a branch of the community, which is this, tr this weird transgenderism thing. Hey, listen, you want to get cosmetic surgery after you're 18? Do whatever you want. Like, it's not my business. But before that, you start putting young girls who are more susceptible to this than anything because of peer pressure, because of social, because of this this uh, gender dysmor uh, dysmorphia, they call it. Like, that's a medical Sport. condition. Sport. And, it is a medical condition. And it can be brought on by peer pressure, by being around people who's, oh, I'm trans, oh, I'm trans too. You know, like, it's, I don't know why we're sexualizing children, but there's a war on men too. And that's a that's another huge one we can go into for sure. Uh, but before we jump into that, like um, what you said about like um, we don't care about your kinks. No, nobody cares. But no, and and I think because nobody caring for such a long time has allowed them to implement things like pedophilia and bestiality, two very disgusting things that I'm even like grossed out to even say right. as norm in this community. And I know it might be a minority, but it's still involved and. It, anybody supports it like it needs to be shut down and you and i think this community this lgbtq community is actually part of the war on men they're and they're in line with the feminist values of this entire war on men because they don't think that it's that a traditional man, you know, a, a powerful like chad alpha male figure is a bad thing and it's not i haven't talked to a single girl who likes a beta sissy male like i i don't i don't know a single girl who, who likes that not a single one of the girls i'm friends with who's married has a husband who was like that not a single one of my boys who's married or in relationships likes that the only people i know who uh, like beta males are these far leftist radicals and then they treat you like shit and they demoralize you and that ends, ends up you demoralizing yourself and like men demoralize themselves in a lot of ways and you know, the, the before we talk about the attack on men we're attacking ourselves in a lot of ways you know we're we're, we're corrupting our brain with pornography we're you know there's this there there is a culture that is putting women against us but at the same time men need to go back to being chivalrous like you know if i take a girl on a date i usually open her door for her or something but you know what at the same time if men want to do those things they might be afraid to because they've been told they're so misogynistic and they're bad like why the hell is it bad for you to pay for a first date why is it bad for you to walk on the walk on the side of the road that's closer to the road on the sidewalk why are those why is it bad to hold a door open for a woman i've literally i've literally seen feminists say it's sexist to tell a woman to smile like, so I, are you kidding me? Like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, do you not even want men to talk to you at that point? Like, there's a difference between cat call and say, hey, mama, how you doing? Or like, you know, some of that, or actually like, being polite to somebody. Like, I, I used to bartend. One of the things you're told is to, is to charm up your table. Like, you know, you see some, you know, I like your shirt, or I like your watch, or your hair looks really nice, something like that. You're supposed to do those things. There's a small little minor compliments that are what I like to call elevator talk, like little small conversations you have with people. But now that's wrong you can't do that it's misogynistic there's a great documentary out uh called the red pill and it's about this feminist woman who goes into the uh the movement i would like to say i advocate for, advocate for the men's rights movement and what they don't and this this documentary really opens people's eyes like i knew all this information but for somebody who didn't know men are being attacked 
everywhere. And the biggest way they're being attacked is in the court system. Because when a man gets divorced from his wife and there's kids involved, his life goes to absolute shit. I have a few friends who have custody of their, of their children, like my, my single dad, and they are some of the best dads that I know. Like the, I, I would say like they're amazing fathers. They take care of their families. They make sure there's food on the table. They make sure their kids are happy. But if a mother who wants to use her kids as a weapon against the father wants to do that, she's allowed to by the court system. And that's what's so messed up with this whole abortion debate. Like women are allowed to kill their baby. You know what? If you're allowed to kill your baby, men shouldn't be forced to pay for it. Like, and that's another thing that women take advantage of. I, I, you know what? Men shouldn't hop out of relationships. If you knock a girl up, you know, it's something that wasn't planned, you better stick around and be there for that child. If, you know, if it's not a relationship, it's something that was an accident, then you know what? You still got to be there. And it, it, you shouldn't need to be forced into child support. You should want to take care of your child in the first place. But the fact that the court system is so skewed in the woman's favor to force the man to pay child support and have that mother be able to like not work at all and not do anything and just use her children for that, for that narrative is absolutely disgusting. And I do see it a lot. And that's not a takeaway from being a single mom. I know a lot of good single parents, they're single moms, single dads. I know my, my mom was single for a long time after my parents got divorced and like she was a great single mom. So it's not like it can't be done, but the attack on men when they are in relationships getting divorced is it's absolutely ridiculous. Like that's only one aspect of it. And then you look at the social media, the rhetoric online that the mainstream media seen that anything that's masculine is bad. Like and having a beard, bad working. I've, I've, I've actually seen working out is misogynistic. I've even seen that one. And they'll come across it, and men will believe this. And, they'll, and the problem is, they'll believe what this mainstream media culture says to them about how men should behave, and then they'll go treat girls like that and realize that's not what girls actually want. Okay, like it's, uh, in America, seventy percent of divorces are initiated by women, and there's a few different reasons for that. But I have to believe that one of the main reasons is the pussification of the men in our nation, the breakdown of masculinity, because your wife doesn't want flowers and talk about, and talk about your feelings all the time. Sometimes she just wants you to pull her hair and smack her ass. And that is just something that is the, is the honest truth. And if men would just stop being beta males and be alpha, and that's not, not, not talking just in a sexual prowess. I mean, being alpha, like taking care of your family, being faithful to one woman, not sleeping with uh, all, all these others, and being somebody that your partner should be proud of is something you should strive for and want to do. You shouldn't let your wife walk all over you, and a woman shouldn't let a man walk all over her. But if you're in a relationship like that, then you shouldn't be with that person in the first place. But that's a whole different topic of discussion where people are just looking for love in hopeless places, and they're just getting in bad, bad toxic relationships just because they're lonely. And I think that all stems down from breakdown of the nuclear family because if you got like, I, I mean I, i'm single myself i never feel lonely because i have a good family around I, I i don't have that many friends but I, have, I spend a lot of time with my family and i you know i work a lot too but i i think that having a good family system will reinstill those values and then you will not value like some strange like, like i mean the fact that even dating apps are a thing every day like dating apps are extremely cringe like you're gonna you're gonna judge somebody based on uh, one photograph and maybe a few sentences in a, in a, in a bio and you're really not gonna get to know that person maybe you're gonna go hang out with them have a have a good time have a bad time and then you're gonna be depressed afterwards like it's it's literally uh this problem of the youth culture that has been a breakdown of the nuclear family and we wouldn't even need to talk about the, the courses of being against men if People will just start having babies in marriage. Like, I know it's very hard. I know we live in a different world now. People do have sex out of wedlock. People have multiple partners. But honestly, if you are somebody who has multiple partners, that's a lifestyle you live. There is no reason you need to be putting babies inside of all these girls. It's not necessary. And it's being irresponsible. And it's not being a good man. And I think, he, and you will pay the price for that out of your wallet for decades to come if you don't understand that at a young age. But I would rather men not sleep with women on a first date, not do these kind of things, and actually just go out there. If you're looking for a wife, treat her like you're looking for a wife and women if you're looking for a husband don't whore out like i mean like we see girls i i, I see girls on instagram like so, some like who like post like they can't find a man in one photo and then a picture of their ass the next why do you think you can't find a man so there's fault on both sides here men and women i don't really harp on the i, I mean i harp on the e-girls like a little bit but i i mean i think i do a better job reaching out to men and fixing that problem and i think a woman who has the same values as me would be do a better job reaching out to women on that issue and that i think is if we solve that issue, which again is solving the nuclear family issue, I think a lot of the stuff we've already talked about wouldn't even be topics of discussion because people would have more traditional, conservative, and I would say, yeah, Christian values. You know, it's, uh, it's become ugly to worship women, to protect women, to be chauvinistic. Uh, you know, I call myself a Western chauvinist. You know, uh, I think the West is the best. My culture rocks. 
I think my religion is the best. You know what I mean? I'm not interested in other in converting to other religions because I've got one. I don't push it around on people, but I'm telling you, you know, talking to you about you, uh, I think you said chauvinistic before you said getting the door and how that's seen these days. I mean, when my niece was 10 or younger, I was getting her door, her passenger door in my car to let her in at Zares in the parking lot. And this older guy, you know, he was probably 65, 70, whatever, is jumping into his pickup truck. His wife's getting her own door. And he looks at me, and I look at him as I'm getting Brooke's door, and I just shrug my shoulders. What else could I say? I, I just, you know, you, you could see it was registering. You, wait a second. You're getting the door for a lady who's 10, and my wife, that's been married to me for 35 years, is getting her own door. I always got my door for my girl. My girl never wanted me to drive. When I said it was time to go at a party, when it started getting ugly, she deferred to my judgment. She would, she, she, I didn't walk all over her, but she knew when to be a lady and let me be a man. And those rules are just, those lines are all blurred now. And it's, it's, it's unacceptable to be getting the door. And I think... Possibly it could be because these people, you know, you're talking about ro walking on the right side of the sidewalk. I do that. You know, I was doing that. A, a girlfriend of mine, it's not a girl, a girlfriend of mine. She's married. <laughs> We're out for a walk the other day in the lake. And I'm like, no, no, I get on this side. She says, oh, look at you. Like she knew, but most men don't know that courtesy. And it comes back from the days, you know, when they could walk under the, the awnings downtown and they didn't get splashed by the, the horses when they went by with the carriages and stuff like that. But it's still... It's still there for me. Like, I don't walk. I, I always walk on the roadside. And I think it comes from betas or possibly alphas that have forgotten or won't take it because they feel embarrassed doing the motion. But most men don't know these things. And they're embarrassed right. by it because they don't know how to treat women. And they wonder why they're single at 52. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I think that's it. I think that we that we don't instill those values, and they're just then they're not like instilled in the home even. And like something like we can re re reiterate back to like the conversation with the birds and the beasts. You said your father had that conversation with you, and that's what should be happening. And again, break down if your family you grew up without a dad, then that's gonna cause some issues there. And I, I get that there's bad dads there, that there is deadbeat dads, and that's like and uh, I I guess like that's the other part of the course of something we were talking about, but as myself, like the value you should have is you're not with the mother of your children anymore. You should never disrespect her in front of those children and vice versa because then, because then your kids are going to grow up to think that that's how they're supposed to treat their significant other. It's very hard to learn what to do by learning what not to do. Like you can do it. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who have bad dads who are good men because they didn't want to make those mistakes, but that's not really the best way to learn in my opinion. And I think, like you said, the men don't know these things because maybe their dads aren't teaching them, or maybe they've been taught that these things are bad. And I, I mean, I highly doubt there's like any um, courtesy classes or that. I mean, I'm, like, I don't know if kids are taught courtesy at all. I remember, like, you were doing like events in like elementary school. You have to walk, like, the boy, boy would have to walk with the girl. Like, I mean, like the Christmas carol or something like that. Like, you know, there'd be like events, and you would have to be nice with each other and be like respectful. And now kids are growing up and they're not respecting themselves and i think that's a big issue of like no like no girl who's out there sleeping with a different guy every night of the week respects herself and no man who sleeps with multiple girls in a week respects himself either and you're really demoralizing yourself in that in that context and then doing things like opening a door because that those won't seem alpha to you i think the term alpha has been very skewed first off alpha is god so we can only be sigmas as human beings so i, I mean that, that's if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty of it like that's the little, that's the little meme we have online but if you are growing up and like let's look at pop culture look at rap music look at hip look at look at the movie industry like men are seen as alphas because they have all these women around them like you know they're they're womanizers something like that like they, they really they really gas that up you know you have like like like, like teen heartthrobs things, 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 things like that and that's not what's alpha i actually tweeted this out i got like some like 500 likes when i put it on instagram mostly girls i i guess but there was a lot of guys like the two and i was happy to see that because the tweet the tweet said there is nothing alpha about sleeping with as many women as possible. What's alpha is staying faithful to one woman while being desired by many. Because if you, as, as a woman, if you want a desirable man, you have to understand that there's going to be other women who desire him and vice versa for a man. If you want a pretty girl, there's going to be other guys who want her. It's all about how that person reacts to that kind of, like, um, uh, what am I, what's the word? That, um, 
those messages, like, you know, someone messaged like, it was how, how they react to somebody talking to them. It's like, yeah, that's the way on them. That's how you should trust and love. And that's what should be in a relationship. Obviously, trust, love, and respect. But we don't even get to the respect part because people don't respect themselves, respect each other. And, like, it's one thing if it's, like, a, um, you know, mutual thing. Like, I mean, like I mentioned the dating apps. A lot of people go in there because they're just trying to hook up. And that's probably, like, a mutual thing. They, like, they know that about themselves. But why are you wasting time building those kind of relationships, those half ass relationships built on lust, and that's about it. And there's really no substance there. And you're never gonna actually appreciate that person. That's all it is. And I think that that's what people value. People like men think it's cool, alpha, they're gonna have this high um, high social social standard. If they sleep with a lot of girls, they seem like this you know big tough guy who gets any girl he wants. And that's really not the case. And I think that is, I guess that would be what's actually toxically masculine. And that's what, and, and I think they've wrapped up what we're talking about being actually alpha and shoved out the window and it's been replaced by this counterculture of men just thinking that's the sexualization is what makes you alpha and it doesn't and same thing with women like cardi b that wap song that she put out and she thinks that that's girl power yeah let's let's just show our waps to the world and that's going to be empowering women the greatest lie ever told by the feminist community is that a woman well a woman will be more happier in the workplace than at home and honestly women's suffrage has done worse for women than it's done better and i've talked to many girls who agree with that statement because women's suffrage yes it gave women the rights to vote and that's great but it put it, it confused them and tricked them into going to work and being taxed by the system instead of raising a family at home because i don't know in what world working for a boss for a paycheck every week is more important than raising a good family but in today's world i guess that's the case Dude, you said a lot there. You sound like Gavin McInnes when you started uh, protecting women like that and saying, you know what, get back in the kitchen. You're happier there looking after the kids. You don't want to play in this world. It's ugly out here. Now, there are this, the, well, there's more of them now, but I think a minority of women want to have a successful career and, and run a company and be away from the home all the time and have their children raised by nannies. That's not natural for women. And this idea that we can't have a conversation about how we're different. And I worship women because they give life. And they, yeah. they sometimes need protecting. And they sometimes need a leader in the household. And I'm not shamed by that. Uh, that's, th those are good values. I mean, uh, you know, we've talked about so much today. And I want to keep you on time. Uh, we've got another 15 minutes before we come up in an hour. But um, for me... And we've kind of talked about this already. My number one issue comes back to fatherlessness. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. we killed God. Nietzsche lamented that it wasn't a celebration. And he also made a prediction after that, uh, you know, statement about we killed God and his blood is on our hands. And then he said something like, we are now going to see the bloodiest century of, of human history. And we did. And and so we killed God and then we destroyed the family and we destroyed all the foundations or we're attempting to, it seems like, by this leftist movement. When you remove the foundations from a successful system, foundations of society basically, what do you think's gonna happen? You can't you need a solid foundation. You can't build a, a house on sand. So for me, it all goes back to fatherlessness. And in the States, they promote it with the welfare system by getting the man out of the house for the woman to get benefits. That happened in the 60s. It's been going on a long time. And now we're paying the price for it because our young black men, 85% of which grow up fatherless, are, are mentored by gangs and are mentored by unhealthy elders. And that's the other thing we miss uh, is eldership, mentorship. There's a, I don't know if you've watched this. If you haven't, you'll love it. It's called A Gathering of Men by Robert Bly. And he's an eccentric, white-haired old poet. I don't know. He's um, a deep thinker, weird kind of guy. But that gathering of men, it's on YouTube, and it is profound. It's shot in the 70s, but it talks about the, the struggle of man. Part of what Robert Bly's theory was is that we lost the ceremony of killing the boy, figuratively. You know, when we rolled in tribes first, when we rolled up against another tribe that was a different color, we didn't invite them for dinner and sex. 
we try to exterminate them. So there's a yeah. certain amount of that that comes from a long time ago. And I think we'd all be better if we started off by saying, yeah, I'm a little racist. I come because I've come from a long line of, you know, fear the other man, you know. Uh, but Robert Bly talks about the lack of ceremony when the child was literally on the mother's tit until 10 or older because they breastfeed that long when we're in caves because that was the only their only meal or whatever uh and these tribes in the amazon they would take this 10 year old boy off uh, literally off the mother's tit and and the men would all come and like steal the young boy you know i don't know if the father was but it was all the father's friends right this mob of men come in and they take the child and across the bridge for a year to where he's made a man. The boy is, he's taught how to be a man, how to hunt, how to whatever. You know, the ceremony of killing that boy. And that boy comes back a leader and comes back a man. And that part is dead. And I always joke about the fact that, you know, I've never had children, never been married. Um, there's hope for that. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it just wasn't in my plan right now. I'm, I'm completely unattached but because i've never and jordan peterson says this you cannot grow up until you watch something else come into the world that you think is more important than you you'll always be a boy until you have a child and something else is more important than you for the first time and so i joke you know because of lack of ceremony and lack of uh, ceremony of your child being born I'm kind of a 52 year old boy in some ways, you know what I mean? Because I haven't had those life experiences. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I can relate to that. And like, I, you know, I have some friends who had some kids early on and they always say like, Oh, my kids saved me. Like my, my child saved me from my life around. And I don't have any kids myself, but I, uh, I was blessed with a nephew last year and, and he's, he's awesome. And I, I kind of had that feeling like this is a new life here. Someone that I could, you know, a reason to live for more than myself. I want to be somebody you can look up to and be proud of. So I really kind of, you know, I, I actually came back to God only last year. I was, you know, Typical man in his early 20s, partying, you know, dr drugs, partying, drinking, girls, everything like that. And it was really de like a general lifestyle, demoralizing myself. Once I came back to Christ after my nephew was born, you know, the, the gift of life really makes you open your eyes to the faith again. And everything else going on in the world, it was really time for me to come back to God. And then I really tried to, um, you know, lead, lead, lead a more faithful life now. And yeah, I get that. Like, you know, having a child makes you want to live for something more than yourself. And I definitely don't have like the experience of it being my own child. And I get what you're saying. Like once you have your child, you become like a man at that point. And I do look forward to that day for myself for sure. But I think that um, with what you said, like how the, that whole society there, they would take the boys out and they would, you know, uh, turn them into men and there's many societies that have done it like uh, the biggest example um probably in, the, in pop culture is a spartan society in that movie 300 they would take the boy away at like seven years old they would take him into the woods they would they would, they would beat the, they would beat the crap out of him I, i've also read in history books that they would they would uh, rape the kids but like as like a torture you know they would just made to like toughen them up which i don't agree with that's really weird and really, really messed up but they would torture these kids they would toughen them up and um and they would come back men they would come back leaders like you said and i i mean Obviously, that's a really brutal society. Obviously, I would never agree with things like that uh, at, at all. You should never touch kids in that way. And like, but there's like, um, when it comes to like hitting your kids, for example, like you, you know, I, I'm Italian. You know, I got I got I got smacked with a belt when I when I stepped out of line. You know, what I mean, you have to have, kind of have firm ground with your kids. You shouldn't beat the shit out of your kids. But there needs to be like some discipline there. And parents don't do that either. And that's obviously like raising kids who are you know talking back to their parents, not being respectful, things like that. So that's a big issue there. But I think like that's like a um, chicken and the egg type issue. Okay, so the so do you blame the kid or do you blame the parent? Because the parent obviously comes first because they're the ones raising the kid. So we're so I think if we're gonna solve this problem, we need to solve the problem in adults who are going to be in, like having the next generation of kids. And you mentioned Gavin McInnes a few times in the, in this interview, and I you know it's, it's not good to say in Canada, but I like Gavin McInnes a lot. You know, I the Proud Boys are what they are in Canada. I'm not even gonna say it, but Gavin McInnes has a lot of really good ideals, and I there's a speech of his he gave well, on his founding of proud boys and why he found why he founded the proud boys and what it was supposed to be it's only about 11 minutes long if you like this one i'm sure you've seen it and he says like america used to be a nation of clubs you used to have men's clubs you know you used to have men would congregate together and they would talk about ideas they would, you know, right, right now what do we have we have the strip club well this is exactly what gavin mckinnis says once clubs like men's clubs became misogynistic and were told they're not okay men congregated in the strip club and then that demoralized us even more if men could still come together in groups and talk about different ideas like politics you know, culture things like that we would have a lot less uh, issues with 
like we said, the fake alpha males are probably have in our society. And it is coming back. There's a lot of groups out there now. I think I think a good place for men to congregate right now is like the gun club. I think that I think that's a good place for men to get together and talk about ideals. But we have made men think that gathering with other men to talk about ideas is now misogynistic and bad. So I think if we bring that back, then those men can go into relationships with good women, uh, have good, healthy relationships. Then on top of that, they can go and raise good children. And so I really think to solve this issue, we need to start instilling these values in young men, like their early 20s, that we it's not misogynistic or bad to gather with other men to speak to one another about different ideals. It's not bad to want to be masculine, be alpha males. It's not bad to want to raise boys to be that way either, because boys need to be raised into men. But it, it takes fixing the men first so we can start raising these kids right. And I mean, as somebody who doesn't have kids, I do talk about this a lot. I mean, I guess people could call me a hypocrite, but you know, just because I don't have kids doesn't mean I don't know. I don't know what's good for society, and that's why I talk about fixing the adults. Because I, I mean, I'm 27. Um, there's a lot. Of, I'm following like a lot of young, young men to support what I do, and we talk about these kind of things. You know, guys in their early 20s were, were who were where I was at that age, making a lot of these mistakes, and I talk to them, saying like, it's not worth it, boys. Like, it, like all these parties, all these raids, all these girls, it's really not worth it. You're gonna demoralize yourself, and you're not gonna be. And if you keep doing this for this long, and this is why nobody needs a like a hoe phase because that's going to hinder your ability to build meaningful relationships in the future when you actually want to do that because you're never going to value the things that you should be valuing. So yes, I think we need to bring back clubs. Men should be able to gather in communities and talk about different ideas. And another thing, there's a there's a TED talk, I forget who it's by, but it's called The Boy Crisis. And it goes into everything we talked about today about how boys being raised without fathers is number one. And it, yeah, the welfare system does encourage that. And it, it's sad to see. And you know, you mentioned like uh, this because you know the right wingers in the states use this a lot. How it's mostly black families who are coming from broken homes. You know, it's uh, it's very high the single motherhood rate in, the, in America. That's like eighty five percent. And there's in the baby daddy baby daddy culture is an issue amongst all young men, not just black, white, you know, uh, native men. It's it's amongst all men that like there's men from all races that have this tendency to have babies with multiple women and that's not good like, that's not a good scenario to be you're gonna have you're gonna have multiple different families raising kids in all these different ways money coming to your pockets for all these kids and you're never gonna be able to be there for all of them so if we really teach and, and i do think it starts with men because i i think that men need to be leaders um, not that women can't be leaders, but I think in this scenario, men need to be the ones to make the first step for change. I don't think it's going to be um, women doing that because just because of simply that men are the ones who, you know, typically are the gatekeepers of relationships. You know, they're the ones who ask, you know, ask women out. They're the ones who kind of, you know, would maybe pick you up, uh, pay for the pay on the first date. Those typical, you know, sh uh, chivalrous things that we say are bad now. But uh, Lauren Chen, the YouTuber, who says this a lot, is she says, for a long time, women have been the gatekeepers of sex and men have been the gatekeepers of relationships. And I think that's 100% true. So me saying that you should value relationships over sex, I think that it's up to the men to say, no, like we're going to go for dinner. You're not going to come back to my house afterwards. We're going to we're gonna, we're gonna take the slow, do things like that. Because I think women are so accustomed to giving it up early because that's what so many men want. That it, they'll just, they, you know, they're more inclined to do it. And it's up to the man to say no in the first place. And I think you surprise a lot of girls by doing that. I think you really would um, get it. Like, you know, there's going to be some out there who might think you're weird and say, oh, well, are you, well, are you gay? You don't want to sleep with me? But you know what? That's a woman that has a lot of mental health issues. If a woman doesn't see it, you're trying to value her and her time over her body. And that's not a problem with you. It's a problem with her. And I think that, you know, it's going to be guys like myself, guys like you, who come up with this message and talk about the, about this kind of stuff amongst other men on our, on our channels and talk about these issues and to wake more men up to realize that this is what needs to be done to fix society. You're not weird for wanting to be chivalrous. You're not weird for wanting to be a, a, a male gender role in a relationship. It's not, those aren't weird things. And women, it's not a bad thing to want to stay home and raise your kids. It's not a bad thing to go get a career either. But I'm just telling you right now, you'll be a lot happier at 50 years old with a bunch of kids than you will at 50 years old with a bunch of money. Hey, and that's just my opinion. Man, on it. man, without the kids, you lose your meaning. And there's so many bitter women out there that miss the chance to have children. And I think they know that they have this big emptiness in their life. And maybe that's why they turn to radicalism on the way out. I want you to leave us with a message of hope, but if I didn't talk about this, I'd be remiss. Tell me how you balance because man, your social media profiles, are similar to mine probably a little probably a little edgier and i don't apologize for that i my hate is very specific i have it i declare it and i like where it's placed i don't i'm, I'm trying to get rid of it i'm trying to deal with it but it's a problem and i think not enough of us take responsibility for our own hate oh no i don't have hate yeah i got hate for a lot of things and i like where it's placed Tell me how you balance your worship of women, 
in their role and the respect or lack of respect that we engage in like for me bill blair is the biggest pig uh, like he's a pig at the trough in all senses because he's a former cop and he's just on the take and so when i mock i am relentless and i am unkind uh cuck i backed off of that because it's become way too popular now but that was a little go-to of mine for a long time that's not very kind how do you balance your provocativeness on the net on social media going after people being a troll which i think is a valuable tool because every you know they troll us from the other side so why not troll them back i've, I've come become better at it too how do you balance that edge of being disrespectful to women specifically because you can't mock women the same you know this is a thought i had when we were talking i didn't get it out i'm glad i came back to it but i'll, I'll let you talk i promise um oh did it leave again oh this stuff dude i need to smoke less weed uh, <laughs> <laughs> it just comes and goes when the red light is on dude it, it, it your brain goes to mush where was i going what what happened there what were we talking you about a, you had a thought um no oh the balance yeah um disrespecting women online oh yeah okay so uh the difference between men and women so i ran into you the other day and i write off it's a joke right off the bat chad yeah jim oh yeah oh cool nice to meet you dude i didn't recognize you with a shirt on that's funny <laughs> and that's a jab that's a personal jab that you got a nice body and you kind of do shirtless TikToks, right and, do, and you didn't know me and you kind of it kind of fell flat i felt like you know you didn't think it was all that funny you think it's funny now but okay well, so I, I, chad i, 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 I haven't so seen you in a while right so i see you and you're ripped you lost some weight and you're looking good and you got a nice suit on i'm like chad what up bro you've been working oh man look you got a fresh shave look at that suit where'd you get that suit man you're you're dialed in today bro okay and now my friend jennifer walks in i'm like jen what up girl did you lose some weight wow nice dress wow you're dialed in you see how that's not perceived the same way because we're different i get that you know but anyways i want your thoughts on being provocative being unkind being rude and balancing that with you know walking with the lord being an example and trying to, you know, rise above the troll uh, uh, character. And so, I see you really getting thoughtful now. This is a first, man. You're gonna slow. Your speech is slowing down. You're you're actually considering this. I've had a I've had a nerve with it. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are just very passionate topics. I'm I'm happy with everything we talked about today. It's it's been like a, one of the best conversations I've had. Um, in terms of that, so for one, I do believe in a righteous God. Um, that that so when it comes to my faith, there is that. I know, you know, swearing the way I do with it that aren't necessarily isn't necessarily being a good Christian. But if people can look past that, uh, this may be an unpopular opinion, but uh, it comes it comes from a place of just tough love. But I, I agree with shaming people to be better. So in terms of that, like I make fun of fat people because I want to shame you into getting in shape. I make fun of sluts because I want you to do better. I make fun of beta males because I want you to do better. There's been so many times where I've shamed, where I've gotten an argument with somebody because I said something vulgar, and then we've ended up being friends after the conversation. They realize what they need to change about themselves, and that comes from a place in my life, like when I was going through a dark time, uh, you know, like partying, not really taking care of myself, like you know, or like, like I said, typical lost man in his early twenties. It took just being shamed by everybody to want to get better. I was shamed by my family, shamed by my friends, saying you're fucking up your life, not doing it. Sorry for the first. That's first F bomb today. That's first first. <laughs> First one, um, you know, sorry for messing up your life. You're messing up your life. Uh, you're not doing good. So we're just going to put you out. We're going to shame you. Dead. We're going to put you down. And that's just how I think you need to approach things. I think tough love is what we need more in the society. I think that being nice to everybody, giving out participation trophies is not helping anybody. Like the, um, in terms of like the drug addiction crisis, like it, it, there's a lot of times like the, when the homeless camps were coming out in Toronto, I said like, you know what, like why don't we – we can't have 10 cities. We just can't have that. And people think, oh, you don't care about drug addicts. Like, oh. I'm like, no, I care about them so much. I want them to get better and not be like unable to do these types of things. So that's an example there. And I think that in shaming people to do better, I, in my, it, it's worked for me. It's worked in my life. And you know, I'm Italian. Tough love is just what happens in our, in our family. So that, that's maybe just, I just, just grew up that way. So I respond to that type of criticism better. But I think that if more people did, they would get better quicker and they would, they would then 
come on to the side and want to do the same with more people. Like now that I've cleaned my life up, I'm doing like I'm doing very well. Um, I, I have a good message out there online. I feel like it's my turn to pay it forward to help other people now. Like there's that movie in the like, 90s came out, Pay It Forward. It's a great, great movie. We watched it in school. And I feel like that's my role right now. And it, in the way that I do it, it's been successful. I've had a lot of people be receptive to the way I do things. And anybody who's not, I think, just needs to toughen up. And like that, that's just my way of, of going about it. And I also do think that there's a time and a place. Like, I mean, um, there's a difference between like a 60 second TikTok. I think I said at the beginning, the difference between a 60 second TikTok and a conversation like today where we can actually dive into issues and talk about things. And yeah, I mean, I mean the, the outlandishness, you know, that gets gets more views. I mean, it is my, that's just me being honest. And I, you know, when I speak honestly, I, you know, I get a little vulgar sometimes. But like in terms of kind of like balancing it and like with like relationship, for example, like I, I don't think any woman I'm out there bashing on the internet is someone I'd want to be with anyways. So it's like, I mean, it's not really like I really care that they don't want to be with me or they might think I'm misogynistic or I'm an asshole. Cause like, I, I'm just not going to sugarcoat it. I'm an asshole. Like I, I just, I just am. And I think that more people need to be assholes in my opinion. I think Canadians are too passive. They're too non-confrontational. That's led us into where we are in our society, being the way we are, you know, letting the government walk all over us. And I think that, you know, I mean, do I, 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 to be honest with you, I don't really call women names. I don't, I don't, I don't call women bitches or shit like that, but I do have a very strong narrative to girls, you know, being promiscuous online, how much I'm against that. And I actually had a girl who used to follow me. I was making fun of OnlyFans girls. And she commented in the comments. I'm like, oh, that's too bad. Here's my OnlyFans. And I got me and all my boys to go into the comments and tear her apart. We said, you're a, you're a whore. You, you know, where's your dad? All this kind of stuff. And we shamed her out of existence. I really hope she deleted her OnlyFans. It doesn't happen anymore because I feel like that is the way people will get better is through tough love. And just because, you know, it's more anecdotal. Like it's worth for me, for good people in my life. But I mean, being kind and being, you know, caring is not helping anything it's just enabling people to stay in their ways and i think that that yeah if my rhetoric offends people good wow i now know why i was apprehensive about having you on not just because of the censors on youtube i have a clean channel man i'm right about where you are i had a good day the other day with that little uh, justin trudeau escaping i just happened to catch it like he was in that second cab and those feds when they left the and no one knew it and I got lucky and it caught some fire and I got some subs. So I'm up to where you are. Like I'm approaching a thousand and I've done this before. You know, I blew my last, my original channel. I blew up from 200 subs to 3000 and from 200,000 views to 3 million in three months, just by working at it. Like yeah. TikTok, it's I've been great. actually putting some time in. I just had my first video break a million. Like it wasn't of my show, but you, this is how you, you got to work it. Right. And so, um, um, uh, I'm just about, uh, like, I, I, you know, I don't know, I'm blathering. I'm, I want to leave you with the last line out here. Um, dude, give me some hope. Tell me the light at the tunnel that you see, like, Tell me it's going to be okay and why. Like, rub my ears a little bit. Let's get away from the, you know, the politics of it all and give me a reason to be hopeful other than we may see a purple wave because I think the electorate is pissed off. I know they are. We've never seen protests like this. It's not because the PPC is organizing it. Yeah, maybe 60%, but still 40% of the people are showing up at those protests don't know who the PPC is. Well, they know now, but they're not yeah. there because of the PPC. They're there because they're pissed off. I saw one of my dad's friends there in Welland. <laughs> I'm no like... Way. Bro, like I and I think he was kind of embarrassed. He knows we kind of think the same when it comes to Trudeau, anyways. But he took the first vax, and we've talked about that. And he's an old friend of my dad's, and we get along great. He used to hear me on the radio all the time. I'm like, dude, I never. I don't know why I'm surprised to see you. I should expect to see you, but he did. He's not a PPC fan you know he's just pissed off he says where's your sign i said dude i don't do signs i'm like a media guy when i go to these things yeah. i'm on the outside i just filming i'm not chanting i might be support the group but uh, i'm not a group kind of guy i'm not a protesting kind of guy but i think it's necessary anyway i'm blathering leave us with some with whatever you feel hopeful for or whatever you see as far as human nature or history that makes you feel like it's going to be okay because I'm black pilled, bro. And I don't like being in that black pill state. I'm grateful that I was red pilled, but the black pill is hopeless 
suicidal type of you know i'm not i'm just saying dramatically yeah. that's in the extreme case the black pill leads to that so give me a reason to take the clown pill and just laugh at it all because it doesn't freaking like it can't, i don't want to say it doesn't matter i don't want to be nihilistic about it but anyways leave us with some hope on the way out chat I'll take it. You like slightly offensive. I mentioned in the clown pill there. I've, it's the only time I've heard that on. But oh yeah, yeah. You know Elijah yeah. Schaefer. I'm chasing I, you, bro. Yeah. Just return my call and get on the show, man. Like, He's Sarah. Uh, I had Savannah up. Hernandez on. She is a dime, great. man. I love her, and she's great at her job too. But uh, yeah, that's that's where it came from. Yeah, Gavin put yeah. it on, and I wouldn't have known about the clown pill. But that's uh, definitely uh, Elijah Schaefer. Love that kid. So you know what, I, I can take a lot of what he says recently too, because he talks about how we need to stay white pill, because the red pill turns into the black pill, turns into the clown pill, and then you got to get back to reality, you have to get back to sanity somehow, and I think the sanity is that in it is that this whole last two years, everything that's happened, and, and yes, I do think there's a purple wave coming, but I, I stated at the beginning, the culture issues are what's, what the real issues in this country are, and these last two years have woken people up to the fact that even before COVID, our society wasn't very great. We were being taxed heavily. We couldn't even afford homes. We could not do any, we couldn't live like the typical lifestyle, you know, middle-class life that we did in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And people are now awake to that and they're pissed off and they want to make change. And it's through guys like you, yourself and me, me, not politicians, not rebel news, mainstream media outlets, not CBC, no one like that. It's everyday people getting on the ground and not even just doing videos, talking to everybody. Because if you are not happy with what's happening in this country, Take a look at your own life and what you can do for yourself. And if everyone does that, which people are doing more and more every day, like I always say, it's not enough to be yourself in this world. You have to be your best self. Then we will save our country on our own, in our own individual lives. It's easy to get wrapped up in um, in an echo chamber on the left and the right. Take a step back from social media. Take a step back from the black pill that's going on and look at your everyday life and what you have and what you're affected by. Do you have your family around? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have food on the table? If you have those three things, there's a lot going for you that you can make better about your life. You don't need to worry about politics all, all the time. You don't need to worry about what's going on with COVID all the time, even though that is going to affect the lives drastically very soon. There's a lot to be white pilled on and that the fact is the next generation, the Zoomer generation coming up is going to be the generation that's going to turn this country around because they reject everything. They reject Antifa. They reject, they reject uh, you know, the LBGTQ agenda. They reject Trudeau more than anything. And they want a more traditional boomer lifestyle like that, 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 our, that our parents had, that our grandparents had, because life was good back then. You can have a family that wanted to come home. And they see the change that needs to be made in themselves. Every day I talk to more young men who want to make a change for themselves. And that is what's white pilled me is the fact that there's so many people out there who see that the importance of everything going on right now is not to trust the plan, but to do it for yourself and to make your own life better. And that's like one of my biggest messages is to do it for yourself, be your best self. Don't just be someone don't just be a, you know, a everyday person. Don't just, you don't, you don't want to be an average show. You should want to be the best person you can possibly be. And more people are doing that. More people are getting involved online. There's more people who are trying to do better with their lives. And I think that that's great to see. I think that this is the white, this is a white and black pill. That the fact is our country is changing. It didn't take us decades. It didn't take us a year or two to get here. It took us decades to get to where we are. It's going to take us decades to get us back. But we are now on that projection to go back to where we were in a society. We are going to recreate a great society here in Canada. The problem is, Myself, you, other people around, you know, who are older doing this, we might not be around to see the benefits of what we're fighting for today. But and myself, I have a lot of babies around my life, a lot of nieces and nephews, and I see their value in fighting for tomorrow. And I think if everyone can grasp that, that if this fight today, no matter how hard it seems, no matter how black boys you might get, it's working. And the next generation might be the one to reap the benefit of it. And it, but that should satisfy you with the continuing to continue in the fight for what's right and continue to promote the values that you want to promote. And I think, yes, a little bit of a black girl, I understand you might not be here for to see to reap the benefits of what we're fighting for, but it should give you a lot of satisfaction that what you're fighting for today, your kids will talk about in the future. Nicely done, my brother. I love you. I love your passion, what you're doing. Um, I don't know where you get your energy. Tell me it's not Adderall. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm high on life, but high on life. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, like I said, I had... Uh, Oh, well, I didn't have reservations about having you on, but, you know, you get to know someone as a 60-second TikTok. It really doesn't give you a good indication of who they are, where their heart's at, and what they think, what they love, what they hate, how they how they grew up, you know, like, 
Um, you know, I joked the other day. I go, I love going back to Welland. And I was telling somebody, I said, I met Chad. I didn't know he was from Welland. I don't know why. I thought he was out west somehow. And I have a, tat- I have a tattoo on me, but Rose City. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I thought... Like your influence on TikTok, I don't who came across to me as way more popular than you are. How many, you know, like 10,000 followers or something, 7,000 followers? Or it's something? climbed down. I hit 7,300 this morning. Yeah. I, I, I've gained 4,000 in the last two weeks. It's going, yeah, it's been, wow. yeah, I, well, I, my, I, my account hit my stride. Well, when, I don't know why. I thought when I was introduced to you, I'm like, oh, this guy's got lots of traction. Like, I mean, you've got way more than I do, but um, yeah, I thought you had a way bigger account and then you're out. Oh, the other side. Anyways, I was joking the other day. I go, I love going back to Welland. I got my French Italian. I got my French guys. I got my Italian guys. And then I got a couple, a few of my boys that are French Italian, which is the, oh, like, go. Go, <laughs> you wouldn't wish that on anyone. As a as an Italian guy, you wouldn't wish that on anyone, right? I'm They're right there. It's the loud. worst They're combination of races that <laughs> it could ever be transposed into a body, for sure. I'm <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, for accepting my uh, humor. It's not always funny, but it makes me laugh. So that's all I got, bro. <laughs> no, awesome. Thanks for having me on, Jim. I really right. appreciate it, buddy. It's um, good. Uh, yeah, and I'm not do- used to doing this stuff, anything other than live. So I'm going to upload this to one of my dinky channels on YouTube because I've got three, and I've got a brand new one that I set up. It's going to have all my podcast stuff. Some, some of my podcast stuff goes back to my 610 radio days, like terrestrial radio. And so I'm going to have that channel as just from the beginning of my podcasting all the way through. So there's like 300 episodes there, right? Uh, just because I don't have a history of my old work online. So it just to be audio. So I use that right. channel as kind of, I'll put this video over there and see if it beats the censors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Send me the links. I'll it, share it if it gets flagged or blocked or shut down or whatever, it's only that channel. It'll be my first strike. I don't have to worry about it. Oh, that's where I was going earlier. I've got a clean channel. I've got, I'm right. all, I almost yeah. got my 4,000 watch hours. So all I need is the thousand subs and I'm back in Google money. There you go. I, I can't wait to get that myself. It's, you, that Google money is good. <laughs> all right, homie. I appreciate your time. Thanks for that. It's uh, what time is it? My time. It's uh, nine fifteen. Yeah. Uh, time to wake up. Anyways, appreciate ca- catching you after work after midnights and uh, stay true to what you're doing. Stay hard. And I love you, brother. We'll talk soon. Sounds good. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. So. Until you do that, Chad, the uh, Canada's Chad, Latanzio, what up, Latanzio, Latanzio, why, why am I so bad with last names, it's horrible, it's a bad way to be, all right, here's how you find them on the TikTok, you can see the URL up there, I guess you can zoom in on it, here he is on the twatter, 1100, that's weak, there he is on the fake book. There he is on the Insta. Uh, he's, he's actually, his profiles are almost exactly like mine. He's got six, seven, 677 subs here. I just jumped like 250 in the last two days, three days. So I'm up from, oh no, what am I at? I was at 340. No, it's, ooh, take it easy. Settle down, Max Bernier show. 644, so I jumped uh, 300 in the last week. That's good. I'm almost monetized, so catch me there. Catch Chad here. Give him a sub. I'm already subscribed, as you can tell. And, uh, yeah, get some more product out there, bro. I'm looking forward to it. There he is on the Insta and the fake book. And the twatter. I wonder how many Twitter accounts he's had. I'm on my third. So it's probably an indication is looking here. He should have more followers than this, probably because he's been shut down before. 7,000 on the tick tock. Good. 72.25. So, yeah, I've got way less than that. Let me see. I can't sign in on the desktop. I wonder if I come up in the search. Oh, I've got 37. Huh. Well, that's... I don't check it very often. Oh, i got two accounts. Oh, I see, I just... What the hell? I have three accounts because every time I look, you know, I make an account. But this is the account I use. The Jim Fannin Show. Um, yeah, 
they keep shutting me down. They keep censoring my videos. It's sad. But it's part of the trolling process. You you got it. This is you have to use this. And part of the trolling process, I guess, is also education, right? You're hoping that somebody sees one of these things and goes, "Oh, geez, Joe Biden does not look good," or, "Oh, yeah, I think life begins at conception," or, "Yeah, maybe I'm not supportive of capital punishment anymore," or. Mm, maybe it's not good to masturbate on a Zoom call. Oh, Jeffrey, this is my first video here. I, I should end this video, right? But this is my first video to break a million. Anyways, thanks to Chad. Go check him out on the TikTok. Uh, he's got a, He's got some solid content. I'm not going to play it for you now, but you can find it yourself. So, peace, love. Hug your neighbor. And I mean this. I mean, this is such a toss away of my show. I wish you peace in your heart. I hope that you are loved and are loving of everyone around you because, because why not? It doesn't mean you always have to be kind. Loving is good. <laughs> and hug your neighbor. Love your enemy. Go next door and say, hey, bro. We've been neighbors for a while. Here's my phone number, in case you didn't have it. If you ever need anything, if there's ever an emergency, and you can't just run next door, feel free to run next door, but I prefer you call me. <laughs> <laughs> call me anytime. Shoot me a text. Here's my number. Thanks for being a good neighbor. I love you. And then give him a hug. And I say him because I imagine you're not going to go to your neighbor's wife and go, hey, hey, hey. No, no, give me a hug. Come here. <laughs> and take off the mask. Defy. Do not comply. I'm out. <laughs>